Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Classic Gaming Brothers. I'm Zach. And I'm Seth. And we are the Classic Gaming Brothers. That's right, we are the Classic Gaming Brothers. We are... I always try to sing something. I don't know what I'm trying to sing, but one of these days, we're going to have a Classic Gaming musical, and that's a Classic Gaming... don't want to say promise. I'm going to say it's a Classic Gaming suggestion. <laughs> you always sing the same thing, though. Yeah, well, it's like it's like the opening song. Oh, the We Are? We are. Or were. were. No, it's we are. Were. Anyway, we'll get right into it. Uh, welcome to episode 87. That's right. Somewhere somewhere in the middle in time. Somewhere along the sacred timeline, if you would. Relevant for the time that we're recording. And yes. And the time you are listening. Yes. But we were, we were chatting about uh, future episodes and possibly for our 100th episode, or perhaps after the 100th episode, maybe 100th and one episode, we'll do a redux on a couple of our older episodes. We'll yeah. Revisit. Yeah. I like that plan. All right. So let me talk about our recently played. So why don't you go first? Because mine's more relevant. Yours is very relevant. So recently I have been playing Minecraft with my buddies. I don't know if I've actually ever talked about playing Minecraft as my recently played, but I do play Minecraft a lot. So the game was originally released in 2009 for those who might not be aware. And uh, it was created by the Swedish game developer Mojang, which at the time of release, they were an indie game developer. They are no longer an indie game developer because they are owned by Microsoft. And the game Minecraft is is the best-selling video game of all time. It has sold 200 million copies worldwide and numbers 126 million monthly active players. Anyway, I've been playing Minecraft since I was in high school when I first got one of the early builds before it went to the official release of 1.0. I used to go on a lot of the old servers that were available on this crappy laptop that I had so that the render distance in the game was so bad the game looked like I was playing Silent Hill uh, because of the fog that it would generate if you were playing on low render distance. So the game is a sandbox game. It's it's sometimes described as being very Lego-like in the sense that you can really build and do anything that you want. Um, so if you want to build a massive tower, go ahead. If you want to build a replica of the Starship Enterprise, go ahead. People have done all those things and more. There's a YouTuber named Seth Bling who actually has constructed entire computers within Minecraft. There's a lot you can do with this game. It's a pretty massive game in terms of the popularity, but uh, really what I like doing is I just like playing with my friends. Uh, usually when we can't decide what we want to play, we will play Minecraft because uh, you can boot up a new world, you can just do some exploring, you can jump into creative mode, fly around and you know build something silly, or you can kind of take it seriously, you know, start from scratch, build up a farm, go, go into the mine. Uh, right now we're playing around with the experimental mode that was introduced with one of the more recent updates. So they're planning a massive update to the game that's going to be rolled out as an official update. But during the kind of development of the update, they will allow you to toggle the experimental features of that update so that you can kind of play around with it and just see how it is. And this new update allows you to have more vast and deep cliffs and caves, which is pretty cool for a game that is primarily about mining. So you can now have these entire massive cave structures that are built um, with little forests inside the caves. There's like underground lakes now. It's just a, a and, and the, the, the actual cliff generation in the game has changed dramatically so that cliffs will have these massive entries into caves or have hidden away ponds and stuff. So kind of some cool things that um, the game is doing to kind of experiment with uh, making the world a bit more interesting to explore. So uh, yeah, it's been fun to kind of see the game progress since my early days of playing it back in, I think I got my copy in 2011. So um, almost 10 years ago. It's and true. To see the game change in 10 years has been interesting. So the game that I played will need a little bit of context, and we will get into that context within this episode as well, since the episode that we're talking about today is Fallout. And Fallout had some precursor games to it. It's a game called Wasteland. And Wasteland had a sequel called The Fountain of Dreams. This sequel was bad. The, uh, the game was released in 1990, 
and I didn't know about its existence, probably because it is a really bad game. It's really kind of gotten erased from the uh, annals of history, as it were. And I, learning about Fountain of Dreams, I was like, oh, apparently there was a sequel made for Wasteland that wasn't Wasteland 2, which is also a game that exists, just not in 1990. I decided that I wanted to see this 1990 sequel to Wasteland, which is, in fact, it was so bad, it became unsequeled. So in uh, in like 04, uh, Electronic Arts, who developed the game, disowned it and made it not attached to the Wasteland world. So I'll talk a little bit about Fountain of Dreams now, since I was recently playing it. And so it's bad. So A, there's no real setup. You play as this top-down view of this... 2D world, and you can see your guy, he kind of looks like a very small Guile from Street Fighter, if Guile was drawn with four colors. <laughs> you start off in a map that's drawn from a bird's eye view, so houses are brown blobs, and walls are gray blobs, and trees are green blobs. You navigate around this town, but you you don't, there's no lead-in to the game, you just started this dude's house, and you go to this dude who runs the house, and he doesn't really talk to you about a bunch of anything they also have like they wrote so it's all the dialogue is like written and they they wrote in the dialogue and it's like deliberately really it's supposed to be like really bad like cajun i think or something like that and it's but it's the world is found of dreams is a post-apocalyptic florida so it's florida after the, the the wastelands the game doesn't really help you with doing anything in the game and uh, the intro segment is is really tough to play. I started the game, and there were three people in my party, and one of the people in my party was already dead without me doing anything. I just had three people in my party. One of them was already dead. So I'm like, am I just dragging this guy's corpse around? Like, what am I doing with this? And every time you, oh, as soon as you're walking, you have to like, you you, you can push yourself into the wall, and it made like a pop up that's like, you're stupid, don't go into walls every single time, and it made like this weird noise. I was just like, I'm not stupid. This game control is stupid. So this guy didn't help. Me. Me. So then I just left this dude's house and I, I get entered this town and I just wandered the town knocking on people's door trying to figure out what the quest was. I didn't know what the I didn't know what I had to do. I didn't know what the purpose of my like character's existence was and why did I have this dead guy in my party? Like these are the questions that I asked. So I went around door to door asking people and they either did they either were not home, they or they attacked me or they tried to give me a quest. I got one quest out of like the 16 doors that I knocked on and the rest either attacked me or would not answer. So the one quest that I did get was to go to a grocery store to go kill these members of the mafia. So I told them, yeah, I'll do this. It's fine. So then I decided to look for the grocery store. There's no map that I could find. So I just wandered from building to building being like, is this the grocery store? Is this the grocery store? And similar thing, you know, like people either attacked me or ignored me. So the attack sequence, it works in like a turn-based sequence where you see the like a portrait of your enemy that you're fighting, their name. You get a couple of options to choose to fight against them. And then you can like run, attack, uh, use a specific weapon. You can evade or you can load your weapon or you can use an item. And you have to pick those things per person and then lock in the moves so you get like say you get four people you go through each one of them pick what actions they're going to do and then engage the turn uh you don't get to see your people your people just show up as text and then the bad guys show up as images and as you kill them the images disappear and uh yeah so i fought a bunch of people and then had one person dead and another person got injured mind you the person who's dead was always dead so i don't feel like i killed them since I started the game with them dead. And so I decided that I couldn't find the grocery store in this town. And if I continue knocking on these doors, I will die. So I'm going to leave the town to find the grocery store. Because maybe maybe it's somewhere else. Maybe I can wander the wastelands and get to a grocery store. Uh, so I leave the town and get attacked by three killer clowns. And they were killers because they killed me. And this is one of those type of games that you would play in like DOS. And if you died... The game would say, too bad, and then close. So I was playing this game, and I died from the killer clowns. And it gave me a message that said, uh, too bad you didn't survive. And then immediately booted to the 
DOS prompt. Like it didn't even give me like it didn't go back into the game. It didn't even restart. It just it just was like you're done. You obviously cannot play this game any longer. And I just was like blown away. I was like this was a a very tough game. B I, I don't even know what I did. And C this is a rough game. Anyway, Fountain of Dreams spawned from Wasteland, which was a much better game and was done in 1988. Wasteland was developed by one of the greatest development studios ever, Interplay. Interplay has done a lot of great things. Wasteland was one of them. And so they created Wasteland, which takes place after a nuclear holocaust. Wasteland ended up being a success, both commercially and reputation-wise. People loved it. Now, we will probably do an episode on Wasteland itself, so we won't get into the nitty-gritty of Wasteland, since Wasteland has enough history to itself that we should do an episode about Wasteland by itself, since this is a Fallout episode. People should just know Fallout came from Wasteland, developed by Interplay. Play. However, Interplay and Electronic Arts, who published Wasteland, had a disagreement. And that disagreement was Electronic Arts going, we can make the sequel to Wasteland for cheaper by doing it ourselves. And we don't need interplay to make a game for us so they broke up they like they're like we're not gonna we're not gonna publish a sequel to wasteland we'll take care of ourselves and interplay was like that was our game we're gonna make our own sequel so they went off and electronic arts went to create a game called fountain of dreams which I was recently playing, as you just heard, and it is horrible. Interplay went off to go work on a game called Meantime, which probably would have been better than Fountain of Dreams, but Meantime was ultimately canceled. Fountain of Dreams actually started the electronic arts trend of creating games in-house that were popular to previous games that they published with other developers because they wanted to save a buck. Fountain of Dreams, since Meantime was never created, we'll talk a little bit more about Fountain of Dreams, uh, was much shorter than Wasteland, and the fans of Wasteland and the press just ignored the game, hoping that an actual Wasteland sequel would eventually arrive. It would. Wasteland 2 would eventually arrive to home computers in 2014, which is a, a little bit of a wait. A little bit of a wait. So I hear GTA people are having problems waiting for Grand Theft Auto 6. Wasteland 2, to do some quick math here... 14 minus the 12, 26 years. <laughs> I hope it was worth the wait. And it wasn't produced by in in Interplay. Interplay has long been defunct. It was uh, produced by uh, In Exile and uh, Entertainment, or in I think it's In Exile Games, which I believe is now also owned by Microsoft. I believe all of the companies, except for Electronic Arts, that had any involvement with Wasteland, Interplay, well, other people that were at Interplay who went to like Black Eye, who eventually went to Obsidian, and the people who were uh, went to Exile. Exile instead of Obsidian have all been purchased by Microsoft. So Microsoft could probably make a Wasteland 4, I guess, because they've already made a Wasteland. Not only did they already make a Wasteland 2, they've made a Wasteland 3. Wasteland 2 and Wasteland 3 uh, are both really good role-playing games. They're classic CRPG games that play in an isometric view where you go across the, the Wasteland, as it were, the post-apocalyptic world. Like, like I said, Wasteland has enough material that we'll do an episode on it and eventually. However, Fountain of Dreams was ranked 41st as well one of the worst games of all time in a 1996 issue of Computer Gaming World. So take that as you will. It's a bad game. Now, Fallout was created by Tim Kaine, who previously played and was heavily inspired by Wasteland. Now, the game Fallout was originally intended to be a spiritual successor to Wasteland, but instead of being like a exact sequel to Wasteland, it was going to be based in the role-playing system GURPS, which stands for the Generic Universal Role-Playing System. The game began its early stages of production in 1994 under the direction of Fergus Urquhart of Interpol play who is now over at obsidian yes who's now purchased by microsoft during the first initial six months of production tim kane was actually the only person at interplay that was working on it eventually the team grew to be about 30 people but were often considered to be the b team of interplay and the game was pretty risky for them to produce well at least was thought to be pretty risky to, for them to produce now at this early stage of the game development the game was called fault 13 which is a GURPS 
post-nuclear role-playing game, which later was changed to Armageddon and then finally Fallout, which is, is fun because what's after Armageddon? Fallout. In the game, there are uh, vaults and Fault 87, which is what this episode number is, mm. is the vault where super mutants come from. Ooh, that's fun. It's in a highly irradiated area. You can visit it in Fallout 3. Oh, yeah. It is in good old DC in the capital wasteland and it's in the it's like the, the, the what is it the sea of sadness or whatever whatever <laughs> that's a good name yeah it's in the irra- irradiated area of the capital wasteland sea of sadness and it's yeah the sea of sadness it's where uh, super mutants and centaurs come from Ooh. so the game takes place as the full title implies the full title of fallout being fallout a post-nuclear role-playing game. The game takes place in a post-nuclear setting. In the Fallout universe, there is a gas crisis that occurs in the 21st century. This crisis culminates in the invasion of the United States by China through Alaska, the annexation of Canada by the United States, and finally, a global nuclear war that destroys pretty much everything across the world. And when that nuclear war happens, everything is destroyed in a two-hour period. You play as a vault dweller. So, in the Fallout universe, universe as things are leading up to nuclear armageddon vaults are created primarily by a company called vault tech which works as a kind of government contractor to create these vaults for survivors and people are brought into the vaults and the doors are closed when the apocalypse happens Uh, and you play as someone who was who was born in the vault so as time progresses you know the original population that moved into the vault either passed away or some of them were uh, frozen in stasis but some of them do pass away over time and the population would do its own thing and you know you would have generations coming from these vaults so you play as one of the vault dwellers who lives in vault 13 which is located in southern california and as a vault dweller you are tasked with finding a water chip So in these vaults, they often have technology that's designed for things like air filtration and water recycling, and the chip that controls the water uh, recycling breaks, and your overseer, who are the leaders of the vaults, traditionally, tells you, go out and go find a new chip, please. So you leave, and when you leave, the year is 2161, 84 years after the end of the war. So you're initially armed with something called a Pip-Boy, which isn't really a weapon. It's a, like, computer that's strapped to your wrist, um, which allows you to access things like your objectives, um, provides you a map system, and in later games, gives you access to your inventory. I like that in later games, you need, like, an Excel sheet to manage all the crap that you're carrying. Yeah, in later games, you, you have a tremendous amount of crap. With games like Skyrim or Fallout, I always get into this place where I, like, have millions of items and i get to a guy to sell stuff and i'm like oh, i don't know if i can i can sell these random pieces of paper i found because they might be plot relevant later <laughs> games are never that complex <laughs> except for the plot element i always need like a f- six or seventh backup item is yeah what i'm always like i know i already have like four items that i use consistently and have been beating every combat with any without any situation but this particular heavy thing is a weapon that i might need for a very specific circumstance that I'll forget that I have. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or or you get emotionally sentimental with something and you're like, oh, oh this, yeah. was this was first my first pistol. pistol. <laughs> <laughs> So my first pistol. Speaking of pistols, you're later equipped with weapons and such. Um, I think if I remember correctly, playing Fallout One, I think the first weapon you get equipped with is either a pistol or a knife, and uh, yeah. then you are subsequently killed by a rat because yeah, I'm bad and at then games. You get mad, <laughs> and then you, th- you throw the game. It's pretty much Fallout One. <laughs> I'm sure, other people have gotten past the rat. After your character leaves, you travel to various locations if you can get past the rat, uh, such as other vaults. Uh, there is a city of mutated humans who are heavily irradiated. They're known as ghouls. And you go on your quest to find that water chip, later encountering an army of super mutants who are people who have been super mutated by radiation. When you bring the water chip back to your overseer and give it to him, you're like, by the way, I encountered this army of super mutants. And your overseer's like, well, that's not good we should probably stop that from happening. And that becomes your next main quest, and you have to stop the super mutants and their leader, who is known as the Master. Uh, Not to be confused with the Master from Doctor Who 
or the movie starring Philip Seymour Hoffman, the master, this master looks like a blob strapped to a, a monitor. Oh, good. Yeah, he has like weird eyes and stuff, and he talks with like radio frequencies. Like his voice just fluctuates different. Oh, that's fun. That's a thing that's actually the game is voice acted, which is yeah, really cool. Yeah, fully voice acted. It's fully voice acted, which is really awesome because they do play around with a lot of the sound effects and stuff for the voices, especially for like an older game. It's pretty cool. Uh, so the game's various set pieces and plot elements were all based on various items from pop culture, such as uh, video games, movies, books, or TV shows. Um, specifically, the 1975 science fiction comedy A Boy and His Dog inspired the overall vault setting. Gameplay and combat was largely inspired by both Wasteland and also UFO, Enemy Unknown, due to Tim Kaine being a massive XCOM fan. Tim Kaine also has said that the entire team were massive XCOM fans. So Yeah, I could, I could see that. Game. XCOM is a great game. This is the original XCOM. Yes, yes. OG, OG since... Enemy Unknown. And also certain perks in the game. So as it's a role-playing game, you get perks and such. Um, were inspired or named after TV shows like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which was popular at that time. There's also a couple more blatant references to TV shows, um, such as a special encounter that you may have as the Vault Dweller explores, which is the TARDIS from Doctor Who showing up in front of you, and as you get closer, it disappears. To be fair, that's that's a pretty obscure reference since 1998. 1998, when Doctor Who was cancelled at the time, because, for those who don't know, Zach here is a massive Doctor Who fan. In the 80s, Doctor Who ended and uh, went on a little hiatus until 2005, and there was a made-for-TV television special on Fox that did really badly in 96, but that was it. So, like, to throw in a Doctor Who reference into your video game was kind of, like, unheard of back then. It's a little more common nowadays when, like, Lego has Peter Capaldi playing the Doctor in one of their games. But, in any case, the overall engine for Fallout, the game, the, the engine the game was actually designed in, was created by Tim Kaine. And he actually built the engine completely in his spare time when he was working on other projects for Interplay. So, between other projects, he would put a little time into this engine that he wanted to create a game in. After Interplay acquired the license, for GURPS, um, which was created by Steve Jackson Games, Kane worked to incorporate the system into the engine he built. So he had to redesign the system that he had created for his engine in order for it to follow the GURPS system. While Tim's team worked on designing the engine, they also experimented with the idea of potentially developing the game as a first-person title, which was immediately dropped because they realized it would A, not look very good, and B, be very resource intensive. So they ended up ditching that for a trimetric perspective. Now, Seth, if you tell me what perspective is Fallout in, I would probably say it was isometric. And, and that's a term I think I've been using liberally in this podcast. But I have to make a correction if I've ever used isometric incorrectly, because I, isometric is very specific. Isometric means that all of the angles from viewing are equal. Trimetric means that there are no equal angles when you are viewing the object. So if the 3D object you are looking at is a square, it could be isometric, trimetric or dimetric those are um, three of the big ones that are used for stuff like games dimetric means two of the angles are the same it is i i was i was thinking to myself i was like we've definitely referred to games like warcraft as isometric when i don't know if they're actually properly isometric so now yeah i warcraft 3 may be isometric. warcraft 3 might be properly isometric but a warcraft 1 i don't definitely I, I don't know this is the it's the trouble, but apparently Fallout was specifically designed in a trimetric perspective. So Fallout was not immune from production issues. The game was nearly canceled when Interplay acquired the license to Forgotten Realms and Planescape in the Dungeons and Dragons universe. Uh, this would lead them to then eventually go and make, you know, Baldur's Gate, Icewind Dale, Planescape Torment. Some critical RPGs through their Black Isle development house, which is a subsidiary of, of Interplay. So they're like very excited to make these games. And Tim Kaine's over here working on this Wasteland game when they were essentially served up known intellectual properties. Like money makers. Like, hey, like, yeah, like Tim yeah. Kaine's like, can I please finish my game that isn't a Wasteland game? This is its own original right. thing now. Yep. And Interplay was like, y you could, but we also have things that will literally give us money without even trying <laughs> yeah so kane was able to convince them uh the interplay that is to not only let him keep working on the project but to prevent resist the pressure to turn the game into a multiplayer game which 
I forgot to include in the notes, but the reason that Interplay wanted to turn it into a multiplayer game was because another little game came out around this time, and that was called Diablo. Right, yeah. So the, Fallout, Fallout was dodging bullets left and right from all the different competition that was with internally and externally. Uh, another issue that plagued the game was that in 1997, the license from GURPS was dropped due to the creative differences between the Fallout Interplay and Steve Jackson games. Accordingly uh, to some, so he, from rumors, as it were, the people at Steve Jackson Games were offended by the excessive amounts of violence and gore in the original builds of the Fallout game. So Kane's team was forced to turn the already implemented GURPS into a new system, which they called Special, which is an acronym for the stats, Strength, Perception, Endurance, Charisma, Intelligence, Agility, and Luck, which I actually now love even more because they made it an acronym, which is what GURPS is. GURPS is an acronym for the generic universal role-playing system. And GURPS is a well-known acronym. And now so is special because GURPS said we didn't want to be involved in Fallout. Now, for the game itself, there were various actors that were hired to play the 21 non-player characters within the game. One of these actors was, in fact, Ron Perlman, who would eventually go off to become Hellboy and other things. <laughs> yeah. sure. The NPCs were displayed as talking heads and each of these talking heads took about eight weeks to create in the application VertiSketch, which was the system that they were using to create these CGI heads, really. Uh, for character personalities, it was decided to keep everyone as morally ambiguous as possible, so there was no real right or wrong choice in the game. As such, the end game encounter with the final boss, known as the Master which Zach we talked about earlier, can be beaten in a variety of different ways, including convincing the master to kill himself, which is quite a way to end a game. Obsidian, who is kind of like the spiritual successor studio to Black Isle, which was an interplay product, and even Ing Exile, which is also kind of also pseudo-spiritual successor studio, they still go on and make games that have morally ambiguous people so that you don't know if there's right or right, wrong choices. Outer Worlds and Wasteland 2 and 3 all have these morally gray type of environments where you're like, I, I, I'm trying to do the right thing, but who knows what it is. A companion system was also added into Fallout, uh, though this was a late stage edition and had to be added through scripting as it wasn't able to be coded in directly. So thus, the companions would experience some really bad glitches and sometimes shoot you if you got in their way. So don't blame your companion, blame the late edition. And this is in Fallout 1. In Fallout 2, they, they it's fixed that. <laughs> bit better. They decided that they should actually fix that. Now, the game was first released on November of 13th, 1997, after a demo was released in April of the same year. It was a commercial success, though it did not meet expectations in sales. By the end of 1997, the game had sold 53,777 copies in the United States and 100,000 units worldwide. By March of 2000, 144,000 copies were sold in the U.S. alone, though the title was proving to be incredibly unpopular in the United Kingdom, where the first game and Fallout 2 only sold 50,000 units. Based on last recorded total sales, uh, estimated around 600,000 copies. I'm sure there's been more sales. Oh yeah, since then, I mean, since I think that's I think that's physical sales that's too. Like this, yeah, this physical recorded sales, 600,000. I'm, I'm sure with digital distribution now and the fact that the game was just flat out free for a period of time there's probably more people that have fallout than that bought fallout. <laughs> so fallout was considered a, a, a popular game and was fairly successful did in fact spawn a franchise the first game in which was fallout 2 which was released in october of 1998 and it was actually released so soon after the first game that they encountered massive crunch when developing it um, and it was not a fun experience for most of the developers who were working on Fallout 2. Uh, now, Fallout 2 was developed by Black Isle Studios, who were recently the named RPG division of Interplay, before they were just called the people who made RPG games at Interplay. <laughs> After Fallout 2, Interplay did allow an Australian developer called Microforte to create a tactical role-playing game called Fallout Tactics Brotherhood of Steel. Uh, the Brotherhood of Steel, by the way, is a kind of hyper-religious sect of people who live in the wasteland who are really into guns and massive armor 
So they wear these big, like, mech-sized armors, and they, they pack mini guns. Uh, and they are, like, old remnant of the, the U.S. government, but, like, as a religious cult. Now, a follow-up to Fallout 2 began development shortly after the release of the game. Uh, this title, Van Buren, was ultimately canceled when Interplay did a little thing called going bankrupt. When a company goes bankrupt, they no longer make sequels to games. Before they did go bankrupt, though, they did release Fallout Brotherhood of Steel, not to be confused with Fallout Tactics Brotherhood of Steel. This title was an action game for the Xbox and PlayStation 2. It has mixed reviews. Um, it looks kind of awful from the gameplay I've seen. The Fallout IP after Interplay went bankrupt was sold to Bethesda Game Studios, and in 2008, Bethesda released Fallout 3, a proper sequel to Fallout 2. Now, Fallout 3 is a kind of vastly different experience than Fallout 1 and 2. So Fallout 1 and 2 have this, you know, uh, trimetric perspective, as you would call it, and are primarily, I would say, your, your typical WRPG, your typical Western RPG. Fallout 3, converts a lot of the elements that were from the original two Fallout games and puts them into a first-person action RPG gameplay style so that instead of combat being based on built-in dice rolling and stuff like that, your combat is now based on how well your aim is or how good your weapon is based on stats and such that you build into your character. And Twitch gaming so that, you know, how fast you are able to respond. So yeah, it is a different experience overall. Um, and, and Fallout 3 is is a almost very different game. It was built in the oblivion engine I, I don't think it was called the oblivion engine but it's the same engine that bethesda used to create their games oblivion and then they later updated it for skyrim now following fallout 3 a spin-off to the fallout franchise was created by former members of black isle who are now under the developer name of obsidian this game fallout new vegas was released in 2010 i will say if you've never played a fallout game and your choices were fallout 3 or fallout new vegas I'm going to ask you why you haven't finished Fallout New Vegas, because Fallout New Vegas is a great game. Which is fun, because now Microsoft owns all of this, including Obsidian, and Bethesda, and in Exile. And Minecraft! So all the people who... <laughs> Microsoft, in fact, owns everything that we've talked about in this, com in this uh, except EA. But uh, Microsoft owns Obsidian, Microsoft owns In Exile... Microsoft owns Bethesda, so Microsoft could really just make whatever fall game it wants to do in whatever world it wants to do it in with whatever team they want to do it with. Yeah, that's true. Now, after uh, New Vegas, Bethesda did release the fourth game in the Fallout franchise. So this is the fourth game in the series, the proper series, uh, which was called Fallout 4, and it's set in Boston, Massachusetts. And you, in it, you can go to Cambridge, Massachusetts, our fair city. And that came out in 2015. Now, Fallout 4, I would say, just to go on a little tangent was a little i don't want to say controversial when it came out but did get some people grumpy because there was a significant gameplay style change from fallout 3 so in fallout 3 there's still kind of a morality system and that is not really there in fallout 4 it's kind of there, but it's not the same. Basically, in Fallout 4, if you ally yourself with a faction that doesn't like another faction, that other faction hates you. In Fallout 3, if you talk to people funny, then they will just not talk to you, and they will hate you. <laughs> I think also one of the other things that changed with Fallout 4 between Fallout 4 and Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas was when you did entered in dialogues in Fallout 3 and in Fallout New Vegas, it told you what your character was going to say and i don't think your character actually talks they don't however in fallout 4 they decided to take from mass effect the dialogue wheel except they didn't fill the dialogue wheel out i i feel like so when you're playing mass effect and you have a dialogue wheel and you select an option you kind of know what commander shepard's gonna say at least i feel like i do oh i also feel like commander shepard is like having his own he's got his own agenda right he's i'm just kind of guy him through the world which is not in fallout you're supposed to kind of embody the person not watch this person so in fallout 4 you're kind of like watching this commander shepherd in the fallout world you select like one word and the person goes off into a weird tangent you're like what the hell is going on so i actually there's a mod that i play when i play fallout 4 which changes the dialogue wheel into chat options and writes out what what's the dialogue option that they're going to say and also in 2018 bethesda would release another game that was marred in controversy and that was fallout 76 which is an online role-playing game 
One of the reasons it was marred in controversy was because for some reason Bethesda was like, hey, what if we release this game that's well known for its NPCs without any NPCs? They did just that. <laughs> they did later add NPCs, but you have to purchase them as part of a DLC pack, which costs like $30. Which people don't like. Especially because the game itself costs like $60. So if you spend $90, you have a complete game that is okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Fallout 76, if, you, if you're playing in a Fall universe without any NPCs, sees you're playing in an empty wasteland yes so one of the, in, in fallout 76 by the way it is an online game so you, it's not like you're completely empty you are encountering other players but this lays other problems that may occur with any online game such as other players just being assholes um so i would say for some people fallout 76 was an okay time uh, for other people's it was not an okay time and uh it's still kind of uh, one of those games that just sits there in 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 like why why did this why did this happen sort of territory uh, in, in fairness fallout 76 was not meant to be a sequel to fallout 4 it was supposed to be just a like hey let's make an online thing with the assets we have from fallout 4 and I think it got a little too much attention. <laughs> we'll see what Bethesda does with the IP, or I guess we'll see what Microsoft does with the IP. And who knows, maybe we'll get a return to form from like a new Vegas style game at some point. Uh, that, uh, that is my take. Uh, I, I did include a note here saying that Bethesda titles are certainly more advanced. Um, they often get criticized because they're not as complex as the past games so you're very you're less likely to talk the final boss of fallout 4 out of uh doing his big bad thing than you are in fallout 1 anyway anyway that's our fallout episode before we put the nail in the coffin of fallout as it were this i'm sure this is going to be one of our more popular episodes just based on the title alone if you're interested in hearing more about some deep dives into not necessarily the history but like the lore of certain games uh like fallout witcher mass effect we could do episodes on just the lore of the game and um, have some content there as well so if that's interesting to you if you're like wow zach mentioned the brotherhood of steel how does that work with like the minutemen and what how the faction changes over the fallout times and what's what's up with the new california republic or the ncr as it were and all that jazz and the enclave and if you want us to go into details about the different factions and stuff like that we will be happy to do so and we may do some episodes like that in the future so as i usually say this will not be the end of this particular intellectual property and we'll come back to fallout perhaps in a more deep dive where we talk about president eden <laughs> all right time to get on to our byway pass so we can wrap up our ball out episode here so i'm gonna go first my byway pass is actually a byway pass that we talked about before if you listen back into our episode in the 30s during I, our british invasion episode actually uh zachary talked about the forgotten city as his byway pass i want to talk about it because it just came out or at least it's supposed to have just came out it was due out july 28th by the time this episode releases it would be past july 28th so hopefully it is out if it's not i am sorry I'm from the past. The Forgotten City, as a reminder, was developed by Modern Storyteller and published by, or will be published by Dear Villagers, and is pretty much a total conversion of Skyrim, but I think they've actually have gone off the deep end and done more modifications, because I think they're going to actually sell it, and I don't think you could sell a total conversion of Skyrim. Unless you get permission from... Bethesda, yeah, or Microsoft now, I guess. <laughs> Regardless, it's using a Skyrim engine. Uh, it's set in a cursed Roman city, and you have to travel 2,000 years in the past and relive the final days of this Roman city. And in this city, if one person sins, everyone dies. <laughs> and you have to unravel the mystery at the city's heart by figuring out where its deadly time loop is happening by talking to people, exploring, and solving puzzles. And the fate of the city is in your hands. Now, I've been watching this game for a long time. I've seen it at PAX, and that feels like 10 years ago, since it's almost time for PAX again. It might have been canceled or will be Kids. I don't know. Anyway, I saw them in the 2019 packs. I saw them again in the 2020 packs. We did not go 2021. And I was very excited about them in 2019. So I will be buying this game and I'm excited to unravel the city's mysterious past. So it's called The Forgotten City. The game I am excited about by waiting or passing on Seth is called Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl. That game was just announced as of the day before recording this episode. So Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl. I want you to picture this, Seth. 
I want you to picture Patrick from SpongeBob, Helga Pataki from Hey Arnold, Invader Zim, and Nigel Thornberry beating each other up. That's, That's the good. game. It is it is pretty much Super Smash Brothers, but this time with Nickelodeon characters. They're they're including everyone. There's like classic Nickelodeon characters in there. There's like references to Nickelodeon like Oh, like our real monster kids. There's literally not Ickus, the 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 girl. Oblina. Oblina. Oblina is in it. But not Ickus? I don't know. Ickus might be in it. Or Crumb. Crumb's probably gonna be in it. You can probably throw his eyeballs. Do you think it's do you think it's gonna be as bad as like all of the things that Nickelodeon tries to do? Oh, I hope it's either gonna be really bad or really great, but it looks fantastic. I'll probably put this down as a pass but we'll see <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm just not really I don't really buy IP games really or like it's like games based on licenses anymore licensed games i haven't purchased a licensed game that i can think of what's it coming out on it's coming out on like everything it's gonna be out on switch xbone xbone series s or whatever it's called sure ps5 ps4 when i think about this game and i saw i saw nigel thornberry like all mutilated like 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 wrapped like a pretzel or something and somebody was like oh there's gonna be a nickelodeon fighting game and all i could think of was nickelodeon hotel and them sending out characters that couldn't move and like being a child and having like this horror show of like this spongebob that just stares at you with these dead eyes during your birthday instead of going to disney world which is like two miles away oh yeah the defunct so, like, land episode on that is is so good so if you're interested in in learning more about nickelodeon hotel check out defunct land and if you're interested in playing a brawler maybe check out nickelodeon also bro that's the game that i am uh excited about buying waiting or passing on again probably probably pass uh we'll see if it, I, i'm gonna say if it goes on sale somewhere down the line maybe i'll grab it do you think it'll be available for extra life well, it might be it might be available for extra life so maybe you'll have to see the game. character load out I, was, I, I would buy the game if there is no dlc if all the characters are like either easy to unlock or unlocked at the start i'm down yeah like, yeah, and and there's a pile of. If them. I if I don't have to put too much time into enjoying this game, I will I will love this game. Yeah. Also, I really want Heifer in it. I don't know if Heifer's confirmed or not, but I want I want Rocco and Heifer. Yeah. And yeah. I want them to beat up Jimmy Neutron. That's just my dream. <laughs> yeah. And then can they do like a Mortal Kombat crossover? Yes. Nickelodeon X Mortal Kombat X DC X DC. All the second rate properties x all non-disney properties sorry not second rate all non-disney everything that disney can't touch yet well that's gonna be our episode for today uh for this for this episode we were talking about we were talking about fallout so again feel free to reach out to us if you want us to talk about anything lore related and the way you can reach out to us is by going to our website www.classicgamingbrothers.com and you can go to our contact form fill that out and send a contact form to us if you don't feel like filling out the contact form because maybe you don't like contact forms or you don't want to go to our website then you can load up your email and type in to classicgamingbrothers at gmail.com in the to field and then from would be your email and then send us a message that way you can also send an email to zach at classicgamingbrothers.com or seth at classicgamingbrothers.com or classic gaming brothers at classic gaming brothers.com so feel free to send us a message and as always we'd love to hear from you that's a great way to get in touch with us and to support us now before i get into supporting us let's say you want to tell people how they can listen to us so maybe you're trying to get your friends into classic gaming brothers because one of the best ways to support us is by telling people to listen to our podcast so what you'd want to do is you want to reach out to your friends and say hey i know this great podcast it's called classic gaming brothers and you can listen to it on all of available podcasting applications that are out there um you can use those exact words i won't even sue you no copyright on those words right there so feel free to use those words and get people to listen to our podcast also if you can and you are able to please leave a review of us on uh, itunes um that is one great way to support us reviews go a long way especially on itunes thanks to that beautiful thing we call the algorithm so feel free to leave a review on itunes and to rate us on itunes as well as on the other applications that were available out there now other ways that you can support us so as opposed to just uh, liking us reviewing us etc you can also follow us on all the various forms of social media we have a facebook and a twitter and an instagram our facebook and instagram are classic gaming brothers and our twitter is cg brothers pod so feel free to reach out to us on those as well as to follow us like us and support 
support us on those. Lastly, if you go to our website, we do have a store so you can pick up some of our merch. We did recently add a couple of items to our to our store. We have a couple of new shirts and such. So feel free to pick up those and it'll be good to go. Good to goes. Pick up those. You're good to goes. So that is... Oh yeah, we also have a Twitch. We don't stream on Twitch a lot, but we do have a Twitch. So you can follow us at twitch.tv forward slash classic gaming brothers i think that's the last thing i forgot though anything else don't play games like my brother and don't play games like my brother i've been seth and i've been zach and we've been the classic gaming brothers that's, that's right. right you know we haven't had a really good post episode celebrity death match conversation we haven't in we haven't had like 30 episodes i will say i was and... watching clips from celebrity death match not too long ago okay. maybe like a week ago two weeks ago and that 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 stop motion scares the crap out of me. <laughs> 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 <laughs>